your silence in the desert place and speak your secrets in the lightning storm. You South African opera singer Pretty Yende has a voice fit to crown a king. She became the first black woman to sing solo at the coronation of a British monarch. Yende speaks to the inner view about breaking barriers and inspiring a new generation. And that magnificent voice you heard at the coronation, South African soprano Pretty Yende joins us from Vienna on the interview. Good to have you on the program, Pretty. How are you doing? Very well. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> How did it feel to perform at the coronation? <sighs> it feels like now a dream that has passed, but a wonderful one. <laughs> I was so, so happy to be part of this amazing, amazing day. Uh, how I felt at the beginning I was quite cold because it was quite chilly in the in the in the in the abbey. But once I started singing and just taking in the experience, it started to be really one of the most incredible experiences of my life as a performer. From what I was able to gather, there was overwhelmingly positive reaction to your performance of Sacred Fire. Did you feel that love and warmth as well? I absolutely did. It was a, it's a special song and the words and the melody, how Sarah Class you know, put uh, the melodies in those in those beautiful words. It was truly touching, not only for for the people, but for me too. Because I remember when I was studying the the song, how I felt, how it touched my heart too. So I knew, in a way, and hoped that it would actually result the same way to other people. And as you say, so many people love the song so much. Mm. Uh, it, also very warmly received after I, I performed it in the Abbey. Everybody clapped, which was really wonderful. Right. You're, you're still young, but you've been around for a while. You've performed at the Metropolitan Opera in New York, uh, the uh, Royal Opera House in London, Paris Opera House, and, and so on. You've, you've done a lot. You've done a lot of great performances, and you've won a lot of uh, accolades and, and awards as well. How did it feel that a lot of people only just discovered you now because of the platform of Charles III's coronation. I feel very uh, happy that mm. I got uh, given such a platform uh, because it expanded way beyond the borders of the people who know me in, in the operatic world. And as a person who loves to share the gift of music with as many people as possible, this event allowed me that possibility that I wouldn't have had the chance to touch so many people outside the operatic world. Mm. So I felt so happy and excited and really grateful. So are you going to be responsible for making opera more mainstream now? <laughs> I'd love to be. I'd love to be an ambassador of opera and, uh, because it's a gift to humanity and everybody needs to share in that gift. And... Uh, uh, if I can be uh, one inch of an ambassador when it comes to that, I'm very happy and glad right. to be. You come from a, a small town in Mpumalanga, uh, Pitratif M. Kondo. I'm also from a small town in, in South Africa, but this, this interview is not about me. Um, tell me about the journey. Tell me about the beginning and how Pretty Ende from Pitratif got to the coronation of a king? I believe it started way, way back when I was about five years old. We had music all the time at home. Every night after supper, we would sing hymns from the church. Mm. And solo career, I think, started there because my grandmother would teach me these hymns. And she would say that when we get to church, I'd have to stand in front of the congregation and sing. So I didn't want to disappoint my grandmother. So I was very shy. I didn't want to do it, but I didn't want to disappoint her. So I did it for her. And little did I know that that obedience would actually lead me to be where I am today. Because uh, those first steps uh, into singing a solo in the church have led me to sing at the Westminster Abbey for the King of England. Mm. And so... Um, Fast forward a few years later, I got introduced to opera. I was watching TV 
And I heard this music behind this ad and that truly, those 10 seconds changed my life completely. It felt like something that I should know, but I had no idea what it was. So I went to my high school teacher at the time who was a choir master and I asked him what it was. And he told me it's called opera. I said, wow, it has a name. I didn't even know it had a name. And then I asked him, uh, can human beings do it? Uh, at 16, I could not believe that this was something that human beings have. Mm-hmm. And of course, it was a good laugh for him. And then he said, yes, of course, pretty if you have talent, then it's something that you can learn. And I said to him, well, you have to teach me. And that's how the journey of, of pre- the, the pretty journey hashtag started. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think for a lot of people, for, for those of us who are not gifted, um, we, we, we see something that's utterly transcendent when we come across an immense talent. Even if it's Messi playing football and, and Messi does something wonderful, you feel this is, this is something otherworldly, right? This is transcendent. And so it's, that's one part of it, but the other part is work, right? Tell me... Tell me about the work that goes into crafting that, that voice and refining that gift. A lot of work. One of the first, first principles that I was taught uh, when I studied music at the University of Cape Town, South African College of Music with my voice teacher, Virginia David. She said to me, if I manage to make hard work my best friend, then I'll be able to have a wonderful career. Because if you don't have that principle, it will be even much harder. So you work so hard that it becomes normal to you to work that hard. And then, of course, the sacrifices. I mean, leaving the country was one of the things that was very hard for me, even though I I had said I was going to go overseas and and, uh, conquer the world. That's what my dad said I said. (laughs) So I found myself, of course, winning the Belvedere competition in Vienna Mm -hmm. um, and then getting invited to to the Young Artist Program in La Scala. But... uh, Little did I know that uh, it never gets easy. It just, you just get better. You just grow. It's like a human being who grows. You don't realize how much you, you've grown and, unless you look at the pictures or something and realize that each journey, as the voice grows itself, you learn so much about acting, which is something that I enjoy very much. You mm. learn so much about taking care of yourself, not only the voice, but the person is important, how to balance life and working hard. And uh, it's, it's, yeah, it, it seems easy. It looks flawless, but behind it, it's like a, a ton of work. You can't and, even imagine. And how do you take care of the person? So I, I enjoy the traveling a lot, uh, but also I enjoy cooking, which is something that I enjoy very much. I, mm-hmm. In fact, I, if this music didn't work out, I would want to be a chef. So those are the things that really uh, make me uh, relax. I watch TV. I could be with friends, I could be with family sometimes right. if we're together, yeah. Well, you said chef now. I read or saw something <laughs> earlier on where you said you wanted to be an accountant. Now, chef still has a bit of flair and it connects to, to, to being an opera singer. When I, when I saw that you wanted to be an accountant as well, okay, on the one hand, I thought, well, at least she can take care of her finances. That'll be, that'll be fine. But uh, do you still have that, that, that inclination or affinity? It seems a world away from being an opera singer. I actually, looking back, there was no heart in me choosing one to, to be an accountant. I just thought out of all the jobs that would get me paid well, <laughs> I that uh, accountancy is one of them. I said, oh, okay, maybe um, I could do that. You know? Yeah, maybe looking- like the South African Revenue Service might use you as an ambassador. <laughs> you know, that would be, be you know, totally no, ridiculous. Yeah. But, but chef, it's something yeah. that's so... I think it's the same as music, you know, it's mm. serving and I love that. I mm. love that very much. Are you comfortable with the idea that you are a role model, especially since you're a black woman in what is historically a lily white elitist craft and world? I feel privileged that mm. my gift has allowed me to be in places that probably were never meant to be, mm. but, um, and I've been entrusted with amazing, amazing operas and leading roles in all of the theaters around the world. 
And the quest was never to be a role model. The quest continues to explore what's inside of me and how can I use it to right. its op- uh, possibility. So it's the after effect that yeah. I, now um, I'm considered a role model, but it was not something that was in my heart or in my mm. goals. It's just um, a cherry on top, which I I truly uh, uh, appreciate and uh, I'm very honored to be seen mm. like that. When we when we look at something like the coronation itself, on the one hand, you're 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 breaking into, as 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 I said, a a, a world that was almost out of bounds for for a big portion of humanity. There was tremendous diversity on display. People at a coronation experiencing different flavors, cultures, uh, and so on. And that was celebrated. On the other hand, we're in an age where it's more normalized than ever for people, not only just in the UK, but in the former colonies and in the Commonwealth and stuff to say, well, do we really need all these kings and queens? And do we really need all these epaulets and oh, you know, all of this tradition? People are questioning that. So you're in the middle of all of that. Is it something that makes you uncomfortable where you just want to focus on, on the performance and the song? Or is it something that you embrace and you're willing to sort of navigate and wrestle with? As an artist, I can only stand on, the, on that ground where mm. we have this amazing um, capability of uniting different kinds of people who come from all walks of life. and my gift is able to be a place of some sort of common ground, mm. a plain ground where differences can be resolved or healing can happen. Joy is found there. Love is found there. Dreams uh, are found there where we can dream of, uh, of, of, of from the present mm. moving forward. So I cannot speak any 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 how except being an artist mm. i cannot be a politician i cannot you know I, those 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 channels i'm not equipped but as an artist i have no doubt that whenever i accept an invitation it is because my gift is able to do what i cannot do Who you are and your gift together becomes in some way a political football or a political act. I mean, <laughs> Langston Hughes, Steve, Steve Biko, James Baldwin, uh, all sorts of thinkers, political activists have, have said over the years that in a way being black is a political act in, in many ways. You can't, you can't avoid it. Um, and so I wonder about going away from Charles III to Charles de Gaulle and your your encounter with the French border situation at the airport. Tell me about that experience. Tell our viewers about that experience and how that felt at that particular moment in time. It was, it was the most unfortunate uh, experience ever because I perform a lot in Paris and in France in general. So it was quite shocking that this could happen um, uh, in one of the favorite, favorite cities uh, that I always enjoyed. Being in, in fact, it's very hard to talk about it. Mm. Uh, remembering how traumatic that experience was for me, I'm hoping that in due course I'll be able to say more about mm. it. But all I say is that it was really an unfortunate situation, which I hope um, can never happen again, and I would not wish it it could happen to someone else. Okay, so just to to, to rewind a little bit and sort of restate the facts of what happened, you had a work permit, a visa to to, to live in, in the Schengen area in Europe. You traveled to Paris, France, and they didn't want to let you into the country. And that yeah. caused a diplomatic storm. And afterwards, of course, you were let into the country, but not without some, uh, some back and forth and a lot of tension. Um, since that happened, tell me how things have been for you. Have you... Have you had an easier path in encountering these sorts of things over the years? Well, I've always made sure, because I travel quite often, so I always make sure that I have everything I need to be able to move without any problems. So when that experience happened, I was reminded how 
it shouldn't have happened because mm. I had what I needed to have in order to be able to enter the country. So it was just unfortunate. Did it make you cynical in any way? Or did it make you second guess the, um, I guess, hospitality of your hosts or wherever you're going? Did it, did it, did it add an extra layer of consciousness to you that this is something you, you, you have to negotiate and navigate in, in your world as a black opera singer? No, it just made it more uh, uncomfortable because I had what I had and it was legal. And it didn't make me think I should do more or double check. No, I mm. always have uh, any, doc any document mm. for any, any place where I, I get to travel to. Mm. Tell me what happens now when you, when you look forward in your career. What's next for Pretty Ende? You've performed at the coronation of a monarch. And from here on in, what are your plans? Is to really enjoy this amazing experience as my um, growth has happened as far as people who are aware of Pritiende. And uh, to continue the quest of using my gift uh, on its optimum possibility. I have wonderful projects coming up and concerts and performances around the world in Hamburg, uh, Paris. Uh, I have put some wonderful concerts. Also, I will be coming to London at the Royal Opera House to sing Rigoletto, which would be wonderful to do that in September. Mm. So quite a few uh, projects already on the way. And I'm hoping that whoever was able to see me perform this time, when be, maybe when they see me that I'm in, in their country or in their town, they would come to the concerts or performances that I'll be doing. Do you go back home to... So, well, firstly, is South Africa still home? Is Pitrativ and Kondo still, still home? And do you Absolutely. go back home often? Yes, I do. I do. Uh, before the coronation, I actually did go home to be with my parents mm. and, you know, to look into this amazing event together and then I came back. Mm. Do you feel like you have a responsibility to give back, back home? A joy, not a responsibility. Mm. A joy. A joy. Because uh, I come from a family that is very big on giving. Our country is big on giving and sharing. So. That would be a joy for me. Right. What is, if you had to reduce it to one thing, what is the one thing that people don't understand about the opera and performing in the opera? The, the perception that it's only for elite people right. or some kind of people. No, I believe truly that this art form is a gift to humanity and all humanity, not some. Are you ever tempted to go more, I, I don't want to use that word mainstream, but in the sense that are you ever tempted to, to, to break format or to maybe drift over to uh, an, another form of the musical industry because there's probably more money and fame in there? No, not, not really. <laughs> not really. Um, I'm really trained as an opera singer and yeah. uh, sometimes so there are artists who are able to, you know, move from one genre to one genre, but I, I'm not that one. I, I love, I love doing opera and I love performing opera. If it allows me to collaborate with other artists who are not mm. uh, necessarily doing opera, that would be wonderful. Of course, it could be a jazz singer, it could be a collaboration with somebody who sings a different kind of music, but I would still stay pure mm. as an opera singer, yeah. And uh, who would you consider your own role models, people that you learn from, people you, you watch and listen to and you feel inspired by? Everyone. Everyone from the greats of the greats, legendary mm. artists like uh, even before Maria Callas mm. and uh, artists who are singing right now. My colleagues, I learn every time from the most uh, celebrated and the least known because we can always learn from each other. Right. Do you feel that since the coronation, you've 
there's a there's a newfound fame in your life how do you how do you handle it i do realize that probably i was i was quite known and uh, you know i but now i do realize that uh, the 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 fame has gone up and how i will handle that i guess i will just learn how to as i learned to handle the one before <laughs> um but what is important and what my team and everybody who is around me advises me always to do is to always be humble and to never lose myself in it and uh, having those people around me who are able to remind me who i am and the character that i am that is able to do uh, you know allow me to be able to be entrusted with such invitations so that groundedness is one of the things that really uh, play a huge role which i believe will continue to do so no matter how famous i become right. i become something i always wonder about people with prodigious gifts athletes artists singers do you have moments of self doubt nervousness fear absolutely you do because um i always say that being a performer it's it's always a leap of faith because no matter how prepared you are but nothing is ever uh, as practice or will be as you practice for example i rehearsed for the for this amazing song and and we had wonderful rehearsals everything sound check but on the day i sat there an hour before you know i went up to sing and i got so cold no matter how much i had warmed up my voice but when i started singing it felt so cold so i was feeling oh no this is not happening this is not how i had imagined it to be so each performance is always a little faith and so to navigate that newness it does take a lot of faith but um, you lean on the fact that you have prepared as best as you can and that my gift will not abandon me or you know fail me and as i look at the performance i say it's in, it's interesting that how i felt it's not how it looks mm. how <laughs> so did you how did you feel on that day at West, westminster abbey did you feel that it that you nailed it that it was a perfect performance no i didn't <laughs> feel <laughs> no i was like oh no i didn't do that well that normally is like that it didn't happen that way so but i'm um, being taught not to be hard on myself because mm. when, you, when i look back i did the best Mm. i could at that moment and also it's not about me <laughs> but it is about not, you really i mean <laughs> no in a sense that in a sense that i am the instrument so mm. i can never truly know how right. it's like you will hear it the way you hear it is always a mystery to me right. so i need to accept you know and mm. and be happy because it was an amazing moment in fact when i look back a few days later i was like you did good you yeah. did good night in so you hide the sun's rays like a hand of flame and set the star to be the stable home and feed our hearts with sacred fire the blessing of I mean it was it it was very moving and very powerful. You say you are the instrument. The instrument is a very pure natural thing in the sense that it's a it's a human being with a with a voice. That's that's the one part of it. But then given the context of where you're at and all eyes on you, not only does the instrument include the voice but it includes an elaborate amazing dress and makeup and lights and and you know the audience and all of that does that ever affect you in any way or is it is it wholeheartedly embraced by you it's very important to me i have always known when i started singing i would always tell my mom mom i need a red dress i need a yellow dress mm. the color of the day for the performance i always know because before i even start to sing the visual 
has melody on its own. So when I had this amazing collaboration with Stéphane Laurent to, to make this amazing gown, we I knew that it's a morning service. It's in the church. I wish it to be fresh. I mm. wish it to be hope. I, I, I had the image of the sun in my, he- in my mm. head or in my heart. I wanted a color that is royal, but... But, but but delicate, but also simple, but something that will stay, that will envelope the gift. Mm. And together we came up with it. I am, and it's 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 part of it's one of the funnest things for me to do, to think about what I will wear. I get to be a girl. <laughs> Pretty and I don't often get the chance to speak to world famous opera singers. You have a tremendous voice and a tremendous gift. And I wish you all the best in the future. And I thank you very much for joining us on the interview. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a great pleasure. Take care of yourself.